This is episode 73 with David Walter. A business should be in business to find out about new stuff, and they should be taking calls from people who are competent, right? Who have new information, something interesting to say. And as uh, Seven Habits says, the, the directors of the company ought to be up on tall ground looking out into the future to see what's coming. And a good way to do that in your research is take a few cold calls from people. Welcome to the Try to Succeed podcast. Welcome everyone to another episode of the Drive to Succeed podcast. If it's your first time tuning in today, my name is Daniel, the host of the show. This podcast exists to bring you new knowledge, wisdom, and truth in the world of entrepreneurship and self-development. Today's guest is the author of the number one Amazon best-selling book, Million Dollar Rebuttal. Cold calling is not a numbers game. He is also an entrepreneur contributor and speaker David's claim to fame came from setting a record of 15 appointments a day, every day for six months, cold calling for a PEO company, or most well known as employee leasing company, setting a total of 1,800 appointments under six months. And in this episode, we cover, is cold calling really dead? How can you overcome the fear of cold calling and increase your appointments or meetings per day? Things you need to eliminate that you are doing to build higher value contacts. How can you generate qualified leads and optimize it for conversion and many more. Before I send you off, make sure to share this episode with someone who has their own business and wanted to be effective in their lead generation strategies that enables them to set up 10 times the appointment with only half the calls. Subscribe to the Drive to Succeed podcast in Apple Podcasts or Spotify. If it's your first time here or if you haven't yet subscribed, click that subscribe button right now. Let me know what's your biggest takeaway in this episode. And it would also help support the show if you could leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. This way it can improve our searchability and more people would know more about this podcast. And now, let's welcome David Walter. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, you know, obviously, I wrote the book, as you mentioned. Uh, that took me almost five years to complete. You know, a lot of people want to know how long did it take me. But um, just, a, just a side note is I could have been an author a lot longer or way sooner. It wasn't until I believed that I had something of high value and that I was an author before I was set out to accomplish that. So just a shout out to people out there maybe on the fence about writing. Just believe that you have something valuable and then start working on it. That's, that's one of the keys. But for me, the kind of the nexus of all this, this story that you talked about where I set this amazing number of appointments, it kind of went back to where I was working with my dad and I helped him make a million dollars with doing some marketing stuff for him. And then we hit the 90s recession here in the US and his business tanked. He had been running it for a long time since I was a kid and he went bankrupt. Um, it was a pretty sad story. I had to find, you know, that was my source of income. He was looking for something to do. He lost the family home. I mean, we're talking about down and dirty. And I went out and got a job cold calling. And that was the beginning, you know, and I'd done that. I'd done cold calling in college and been very successful. So I did it again. And uh, when I took the job, it was, they, they, they kind of set the bar really high. Like, oh, you can make all this money, you know. And with all these commissions, you add them all up. And then when I got on the job, I saw people were just setting two appointments a day. Just that was it. And the, the manager had me sit with everybody and listen to their style. And literally people would be, oh, I got two appointments today. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah, you know, with, with the bell in the old school office. <laughs> ding, 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 I got two today. And uh, I thought, man, I could do better. And so I did, you know, I, I read How to Win Friends and Influence People. I've read a lot of books. Uh, it helped me win my old job. Now I was doing B2B calling before it was B2C. So this is my first B2B calling that I ever done. I was a little worried about calling a business and interrupting them, right? But then I sort of realized that they get calls all the time. You know, a business should be in business to find out about new stuff. And they should be taking calls from people who are competent, right? Who have new information, something interesting to say. And as uh, Seven Habits says, the, the directors of the company ought to be up on tall ground, looking out into the future to see what's coming. And a good way to do that in your research is take a few cold calls from people. So anyway, I got over that pretty easily. But uh, I had to make a lot of money fast. I had to get an apartment, pay, keep paying for my apartment and my car and all this stuff. I didn't want to lose it. And so I read some books that I hadn't read before. See you at the top. 
the main one would would be you could still reach the top. Is it Zig Ziglar or uh, Zig Ziglar? Yeah. See you at the top. You could still reach the top. Anyway, he talks about claiming your goals in the mirror, and that's really my signature thing. I just said I'm going to set 15. I set this goal um, of setting 15 appointments a day, and I just looked in the mirror and said every day, Danielle, that I'm going to get 15 appointments today. I did that, and what what happened basically is. In that six months, my subconscious mind got the message and it helped me come up with an entire new strategy for doing cold calling that really to this day, even after the writing the book and even marketing it for several years now, a lot of people aren't grasping because basically everyone was setting two appointments and I started setting 15, literally six months later to the day I went to work and I set 15 appointments that day. Right. And I did it every single day after that for six months straight, literally a hot streak, like a Nolan Ryan hot streak. Yeah. <laughs> no, a no hitter hot streak. Right. 15, 15, 15. It's unbelievable. That's a testament to the power of the subconscious mind, putting me in the Zen mode. Right. But I had to I had to memorize and, and have something for every objection. Right. I put my system in place and I was on point on everything from the end, end result I wanted from the beginning, getting past gatekeepers, my subconscious mind had rewritten everything. I had that complete strategy that's now in the book, right? But uh, that's that's kind of the story. And, and one of the big things is just, we can talk about whatever you have for today, but just one of the points is that how, how was I able to do 15 when everybody else did two? It wasn't just that I had a better, better, better. Is that I, one thing I set out and I realized what's possible What's possible when I sit there and call and the majority of the people tell me they're happy with what they have and very few people would say, I'm, I want to talk. How could I change the game and set more appointments in that environment? And I realized the only way to do that would be that I had to carve out some of the people that told me they were happy with what they had. That was the, that was the ground that I had to expand my number of appointments. I wasn't going to find more people that had a need. Go ahead. Uh, what were you selling back then? It was uh, employee leasing, which is now called professional employers. I mean, is like is it like stuff. an employee uh, employees for hire, something like that, or like an outsourced thing? Or it was not sourced of the management of your own employees. Uh, Admitted staff was big, and then they changed their name to something else. I forgot what they're called now, but they're one of the big players in this, and it's a professional. It was brand new then. Yeah, they're professional now. Well, they, you come to work for us on paper, right? We do your payroll. We do your health insurance, your workers' comp. We do the health safety, risk management, all that stuff. And we kind of charge you per employee to do all that stuff. It, was a, it wasn't a simple concept. And, and during back, back at the time when you're setting up 15 appointments per day, is it face-to-face -face or is it through phone call or how does it work? That was cold calling. It was just cold calling. Now, just to, I wasn't going to meet these people. I was just a cold call. And then you connect with, with the line manager or something that goes with the cell directly, or is it you directly selling them? Yeah, they would, they would take the appointments and they would qualify them, uh, verify them, and then they would send them to a sales rep, who oftentimes I would see them through in the company, and they would talk. They all wanted my appointments. They wanted mine. <laughs> Interesting. Well, that's actually one of my first job as well was a telemarketer. And based on experience as well, it can be one of the hardest and most of the one of the most rewarding job that you can have, especially when you plan to go in business yourself. Um, because it, it's like the dirtiest job that one could have. Like, you know, back in the day, you expect to, to dial 100 people a day, expect, you know, to qualify them maybe 30% and close down a one or two deal in, in, a, in a week's time or something like that. So my, my question to you is, what's your motivation doing that? I mean, it feels like it's insanity at some point because it's 15 connects, right? I mean, 15 lead appointments in a day. So I got 40 contacts a day to get 15 appointments. And so they agreed to set a meeting for 20 minutes to meet with the sales rep to, to learn about employee leasing. That, that was the basis of what it did. Understood. And you mentioned about million dollar rebuttal, right? Because one of the one of the things that, you know, that the lead comes with a sale is the first contact, right? Um, what are your like tips, tricks, you know, 
you know, especially right now, I don't know if people are still believing that Cold Call is alive or even dead. You know, what, what are your thoughts on that? I just went out, one of the people that paid my paper for my program, uh, I just went out, I upcharged him a little bit, and I went out there in LA, sat with him, and called with him. And he set 15 appointments. We set 15. Uh, he was excited. We got, we actually got a few people that had a need. And he, we set, uh, what about 10 appointments, I think, in one day. Um, and then I, I had to leave the next day. So I was really there with him for one day. But I had told him he was following my scripts and my videos. So that was just a few weeks ago in LA. So the way I understand it, you're right. You're writing scripts. You're you're mapping out the lead journey, or how does it work? Initially, I just went through stages, right? In other words, there's all these obstacles. The main one people focus on is you know kind of like the the water story heroes is how I got past the gatekeeper. <laughs> uh -huh. I got past the gatekeeper. I'm the champ. So that's 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 like people focus on that. But obviously, you can't get to the decision maker and have a conversation mm -hmm. unless you go over that first obstacle. And so that was, that was my first obstacle. And I have a lot of things that I, I had to figure out. Um, one of those, and this is something that's very counterintuitive. You tend to just want to call people one time. I have, I have somebody I'm coaching right now that still hasn't gotten this. I just had a call with him the other day. Uh, I'm going to join in calls on with him where he's going to call me and then I'm going to be on the call with him. And I already have an inkling of what, where he's going wrong. You can't just call somebody one time. If they called you, Danielle, right now, you're on a podcast, you know, your assistant's going to say, I'm sorry, he's on a podcast and you just did another one. You just mentioned you did another one right before this one. Right. So yeah. you're one busy guy, <laughs> but you know, an hour from now, or maybe two hours from now, you may be on your computer. Uh, the phone's right there. So if I called this morning to, you know, this morning, I would have gotten you. But if I called later in the afternoon, I might get you. Or if I called in the afternoon, right before evening time, I might get you, right? So if I called three times, then I increase my chances of getting you. Yes. And, and it, it feels weird when you're calling to do that. You tend to call down your list and you feel like, yeah, uh, eh. Whatever. Yeah. Well, why not call back through the list and then come down through the list? You do that three times. And lo and behold, every time I've done that, you know, we've called through. I know we just did a campaign. Uh, I consult with the company that I'm here and they give me office space. And we did a campaign, I recorded it, and I trained a guy, and he got 15 appointments in one day. Um, but when we first did our calling, we had only set three or four. We had gone through the list and set three or four. And he kind of had a feeling like we're not going to do it. Well, we went back through that list three or four times in that day, and we squeezed out 15 appointments. Interesting. That's huge. Yeah, exactly. And and I assume because, you know, cold calling in, in a B2B and a B2C are totally different, right? Um, for B2B, maybe you're dealing with the director or maybe, maybe you're the one dealing with the CEO of the company, I mean, the decision maker. So receiving pre-calls in a day on a different timings can a little bit be annoying sometimes, you know, especially if you don't know that person. Okay. That's, you just hit the reason why people are afraid to do this. They're afraid to do that because they believe that they're going to burn their list, right? And it's not true. Basically, what we're talking about is the title of my book, Cold Calling is Not a Numbers Game. That's what we're talking about. It's not a numbers game. What they're afraid of is that exact thing. I'm going to call three times. They're going to say, this jerk keeps calling here. His name's David Walter. You know, let's put him on the blacklist. I looked him up on LinkedIn. Here's his picture. Never take a call from this joker right here, right? That's what they imagine. But what you don't imagine is the thousands of calls that a company gets a day, okay? And, and now, do you stand out when you call the receptionist? Do you say, this is David Walter, and I'm calling from Iconoclast Publishing, and I'm trying to reach the decision maker, Jacob Peterson, the end today. Well, and I do that. Uh, this is David Walter calling from Iconoclast Publishing again. Yeah. I'm looking for Jacob, and I do that three times. I might stand out. And, oh, even worse, would you like his voicemail? Yes. Voicemail. This is David Walter calling from Jacob Peterson. I'm a kind of class publishing. Would I burn that list if I did that? Yeah. Don't leave voicemails. Don't announce the name of the company you're calling from. Just say, this is Dave trying to get a hold of Jacob. What you do is you minimize your footprint. Because you're not speaking to the decision maker. Yeah, you're minimizing it. You're blending into all the other calls, right? You don't stand out. And if you do that, and every time you do is, is uh, Jacob's already gone for the day. He's probably not even made it in yet. 
This is Dave. We'll call for Jacob. He's probably not even made it in yet, right? I'm calling back. He's probably already gone to lunch. You know, I have a negative. I do I do the reverse. And they're like, no, actually, he's just uh, he's about to go to lunch. You caught him. Uh -huh. He's probably already gone for the day. I change it up when I call each time. Just a quick one, because I know there's a lot of tips and tricks about this. Yeah. Some people even blend in using media outlets like you know, I'm calling from, I don't know, CNN or whatever media outlet that, you know, if you're like reaching out the decision maker, definitely you never like call the reception, right? Uh, some some people would probably say like, you know, I lost this number. We met on an event. Uh, I met, you know, his assistant. So I got his card, but suddenly lost it. Can you just transfer the call, please? You know, something like that. Well, that, that's lying. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was about to ask because most what people... What's going to happen? It works. And then the decision maker comes on the phone. And says, where did we meet? When were we together? They call you out. And almost all the time, you're going to get caught. And you're a liar. Then you burn your chances. It's better to be evasive, not mm -hmm. to lie. Evasive is not really directly saying what you're doing. Um, you know, there's some things you can do. Is that, hey, I'm, I just got on my flight. I'm calling, you know, like you're calling from an airplane. And I'm trying to get a hold of before I land. I'd like to get a hold of Jacob. There's little things like that you could do, but you don't want to lie that you know the person. That's what people try to do. That's the easy way. The one thing you can do is mail something to people before you call them. Okay, then that, because that, what you're talking about now is what's his call regarding, right? What's his call regarding? Why do you want to talk to Mr. Peterson? And that's when they lie. You feel like if I lie and I say, uh, I'm returning his call or whatever you said, oh, we're, we're in a band or we met on a plane or something. That's when they feel the need to do that. Mm -hmm. But if you if you mail them something, even even simply a thank you card, right? If you mail something out to them and you just hey, uh, I'm from this company, we offer these type of services, and I'm going to be calling you. You should be expecting my call. Then when they they ask, uh, you said no, he's expecting my call. And of course, my favorite is it's in the book. What's his call regarding? I just say it's a financial matter. So that's a way of being evasive, but it's making it sound important. <clears throat> This is a financial matter. They don't know what the heck you're talking about, but they're going to transfer the call. Yeah, because they sound intimidated or they they might, you know, seem it's important, right? And then also, I'm just really curious because most salespeople are obsessed with leads, 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 right? Appointment, 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 appointment. But the question is, how do you increase the, the lead towards a conversion? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Because I mean, if a person calls 100, it, like you mentioned, it's not a numbers game, but of course, the more dial you, you put in, the more chances of winning. That's what people believe in, in, in the cold calling. So the same context, not calling 200 separate people, but making two or 300 calls to 50 to 60 or 100 people increases my chances, right? If I, if I call 100 people in order, I call you and you're working right now. You're gone. I, the next guy I call, he just went to lunch. The next guy... I call through a hundred times. I can make one pass. I could miss everybody. I just want to make that point clear. If you do, you have to call lower numbers of people more times. All right. So that's one thing. You you call the same people all over the time um, until you reach a response, a desired response from them. And then what's next? How do you qualify them? I mean, that's why elevator pitch has a term, right? You need to make the point across as fast as possible. So what's next? How do you qualify the leads? I want to take a quick moment to inform you that our free guide on how to start a podcast is now up on our website on the drive to succeed.com forward slash guide. If you're someone who wanted to start a podcast but don't know where to start, what type of equipment do I need to have to record and publish and promote my podcast? What type of format or guest do I need to have on my show? And you don't know where or how to do it, just please go to the website and download the guide and it's absolutely free. Again, the link is the drive to succeed.com forward slash guide. Once again, thank you so much for listening. Let's get back to the rest of the episode. Well, you qualify the leads before you call them, right? That's one of the things in my book is you qualify your leads first. That's, that alone leads to higher contacts. When you don't know the name of the person you're calling, when and then you, you didn't call beforehand, you don't know they're out of business, you don't know that that guy doesn't work there anymore, you, you should have somebody who's not a salesman, ideally, scrub that list 
to get the name. And I have scripts to do that in my book and my training videos. I have videos on how to do that. But you should scrub that list first. It's, it's magical how many more contacts you make when you're calling a scrub list that, you know, everybody on this list has, you know, at least 20 employees. We know that there's nobody here out of market. You're calling Dallas or I'm calling Dubai and there's nobody in the United States. They're all Dubai companies, right? If you can only do business in Dubai, every company that the corporate office is not in Dubai is a wasted lead, right? We scrub those out. We scrub all that out. We have a clean list. We know that we know all the CFOs, controllers' names. We can call and ask them by their first name, right? We even have some extension numbers. We even have some direct dials because we found some of that. All those things increase, and, and it's like night and day. Literally, people calling unverified list, and if they don't even do call back over and over again, you're talking about what you said, two appointments a week. You call a verified list, qualified list, and you call over and over again, you look at it talking, you can increase your contacts. Whatever it is, you're getting one or two contacts a day. You could get maybe 10 contacts a day or 15, all the way up to 40, what I was doing by doing that. That's that's one of the big steps you have to do. But I think what you're talking about is conversions. Like how, how do you, can you increase the chances of making a sale? And that's that's actually before you even start calling. Before you even pick up the phone, do is what you're offering, do you have a unique selling proposition? If you don't, you're you're wasting your time even getting on the phone. Have you researched the market? Do you know that you have something competitive? Do you have a competitive advantage? And you should know what that is before you start calling because that is your elevator pitch. That's what you're selling, right? You can smell it. Go ahead. So would you say that you you set you set a number of hours or a minute in a day where you just do your own research before validating those lists or you validate the list and then go and the research and then call them. You could have somebody validate. Let's say I'm the CEO or I'm, I could have somebody validating the list, right? I could have somebody in the salesman. I could have them watching the videos, right? You could have several things happening, but the top person in the company, a salesman, what a salesman has to do is they, they can't change the business model, but they have to look at the business model and say, what in what is it that we do that's different? Or what can I do to make this different than what I'm calling, right? You have to find something different, something unique about it. Now, but if you're the CEO, then you can you can say, what can we actually change about our business model? There's two ways of doing it. What can I look like when I worked for a uh, security distribution company doing cold calling, right? I want it to be unique. And, and talk about the things that people don't talk about. That's the best way to get someone's interest on a call and the best way to sell them in the end, right? So it starts, it's not even about your list or your script. It's not about your pitch, but it is your pitch, right? I'm gonna pitch my unique selling proposition and, and uh, Jeffrey Gittimer and many other people have commented that most companies do not have a unique selling proposition. The, the word unique is the most important part of that. And so, you know, I, I in my in my new book that I've written, I break down how to come up with a unique selling proposition. And I'll just mention one thing around. One thing about it is if you're in an industry, there's so many other people around the country and around the world in that same industry. And if you can look out and look at maybe the people in your city, what are they doing differently? What are people in New York to do what you do? do how, what are they doing? Look at their website. Oftentimes, there's people that are already innovating and doing something different in a different market. They found a different way to do it, a different pricing model. They found they've added services, they've done things, you know, just like the theater chains. Yeah. Somebody decided they were going to go to theaters. They were going to go to those big seats, right, and change the whole look and feel of the theater. Well, they were unique. Somebody did that, and then somebody else copied them. And it's something not every theater has that. It's actually famous here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you in Dubai, you guys probably had that first, right? <laughs> I think so, yeah. Y'all were probably the innovators over there. And then somebody, you know, one of the executives from one of the theaters went to Dubai and said, man, they have this really this great seating that you can lean back and it's got a motorized thing and all that. And these big giant cup holders. We're going to change our seating, you know? So there's always an innovator out there. Just copy the innovator. 
So that's one way. So that answers it. If you've done that and you've you've copied the innovator and you've changed, well, when you you or the salesman or your salespeople get on the phone, that's their pitches. Hey, we have this new seating arrangement for our theaters, right? But now, but once everybody has it, is it new anymore? No. We got to change again. Got to change again. And so that actually reminds me of. Uh, but he has a book about catch the wave, and it's got a surfer. It's got a guy surfing a wave, and he's a really famous author. Profit first, Mike Knockwoods. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. profit first. Yeah, yeah. Okay, he's gonna wave. He's he endorsed my book. Oh, okay. He used to get mad. I couldn't, remember, but I did remember his name. But that's if you read that book. I forget it's Catch the Wave or the Wave or something. He literally talks about how the, this whole theater chain thing is a wave, and you ride the wave and it goes away, and then you get on a different wave, right? It, you just keep changing your model. You know, like in the IT space, it was break fix. And then they, there was managed services wave, right? And that comes and peaks. And now it's the cloud or it's unlimited everything with your IT where you, we even do programming and we do projects and moves is all included. So you have to get on that wave. And, and that's, that's really how you sell. The, the thing here that I expanded is trying to find people that have a need is the other reason why people set only one or two appointments a week. And, and just a quick question as well, because I know you're pretty much um, active on LinkedIn as well. I think you have a cold calling challenge. 30 day challenge I'm doing right now. Yeah, yeah. so you're you're probably on day eight or day nine or something the last time I checked. Yeah. So I, I was just curious as well, because you mentioned about innovation, those theaters and all that. Um, have you uh, done something about the cold calling process that you inno- you somehow innovate? I don't know how it can be innovated. Uh, maybe it can be integrated um, into you know a more robust robust marketing platform or automation. Well, I've innovated my new book. Uh-huh. My new book is the new innovation. Can you tell us a little bit about that? If you haven't I shared it. <laughs> I can't. The book's called Prospecting Secrets, but I'd be happy to come on here because basically I was going to take and combine that mm-hmm. because when you change your business model, what I didn't talk about in my first book yeah. is that you have to change the way you sell. Mm-hmm. In other words, if I'm going to target, I've alluded to it, but people that don't have a need, Right. That's a huge change shift. All sales, everything is focused on finding somebody, qualifying them, like you said, qualifying them to have a need. Mm -hmm. I don't qualify people to have a need when I call them because I increase my number of appointments by right off the gate telling people I knew that you were happy with what you had. So how am I then going to go back and say, now, what do you not like about what you have? No, but I was lucky I found the unique stuff when I was doing, when I worked in the uh, camera alarm systems and all that stuff. I found all the stuff that was collecting dust that nobody was focusing on. That was all new, unique stuff and started pitching that. And I was very successful. And I got lucky when I went to work for CSI that the employee, the employee leasing model was the new, new thing. What I did is everybody else was having a trouble trying to explaining it to people. And they were trying to sell it like it was insurance. <laughs> I grabbed the bull by the horns and said, right out the gate, we I'm calling about something new that you may have never heard of before. And see, that got me the conversation started. It's so easy. And they, they don't have to have a need, right? How could they have a need for something new on the market? They probably don't. <laughs> I mean, but they it, don't know about it. Yeah, exactly. So my call is not to sell them. My call is to educate them, right? Now, what I've qualified beforehand is that they – have the they're at the income level that I want. They have and there's all kinds of ways you can do that. I'll, when I see a corporate structure, the number of employees, different things say this company has the the money to pay for what I, we want to sell, right? There's ways you qualify it without qualifying them. And of course, when I set the appointment, let me make sure that that you guys how many employees do you have? You have this many employees, right? That this is your corporate office. So we double check all that stuff. That's how I qualify it. Not do you have a need and how badly do you hate your current provider? <laughs> <laughs> Understood. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I'm sure some of you know some of the audience who will be watching this will be like mind blown as well because <laughs> you know you're probably talking opposite of what the cold calling or sales uh, connotation is all about. All those majority, I believe here in Dubai, you're already implementing, you know, uh, LinkedIn, you know, setting up appointments, but majority like real estate, like I think we have um, 7,000 real estate agents here. 
that's how huge it is. And well, take real estate. Have you heard of Open Door? No. So we have these these companies in in uh, the United States mm-hmm. that they come in and they buy your home from you. So that's an innovation, right? I'd love to cold call for Open Door. I'm a real estate agent, but guess what? I'm not going to advertise to find a buyer for your house. I'm just going to come buy your house from you. That's a new way to do real estate. And then you you set up an, an event or something like that and then invite them over or how does... They're doing traditional marketing, right? I don't even know their cold call. But I could cold call, I get a list of homes in the target market that I don't want it mm-hmm. and call them and ask them if they've ever thought about selling their house and say, hey, um, we would love to just give you an offer for your home just so you know what it's worth. We're going to come out there, we're going to look at your home and we're going to say, this is what we're going to buy it for. And set an appointment to come out and do that. I could probably exponentially increase their sales by doing that. I'm just giving that's an example. There's always somebody doing something new. A copy that. Yeah, I think there's also a book like Good Artists Steal Ideas, something like that. <laughs> Because it's already proven. Why why try to invent a wheel that's already, you know, working? Um, speaking of wheel, I know that you you mentioned about your father earlier, um, which went, you know, bankrupt. I assume that was like years and years and years ago. Um, yeah. I'm just really curious. Um, do you ever come to a point in your business where you're almost in the same place? And how do you, you know, build your business from the ground up? I went bankrupt uh, at the end of my cold calling company. When I started my cold calling company, I got put out of business by all these people that went into the, I started a vertical. Mm-hmm. And then after 13 years, lots of people got into the vertical marketing to that same offering services. So many, so many that I could hardly even find clients anymore. Wow. And I had to throw the towel in, right? And I got out. That's when I wrote my book. Because I thought, okay, you know what? I'm not, cold calling is not really something you should hire uh, outside company to do. It's something that you should hire salespeople and train them and do it internally. So I'm going to provide them a script and a book for them to do it. And so, yes. And so how to go from nothing, you really have to get testimonials. And the best way to do that is to offer your service for free to somebody. You know, like right now, I'm, I'm including my 30-day offer to some people. Uh, it's limited, and you have to – it's still open. It's going to close on Sunday. I don't know how fast you're going to get this podcast out, but, you know, that's this week. So, but I do these every once in a while where it's free to get in more testimonials. Yeah, and then somebody else told me to start a club, start a meetup, right? That's another way to do it. Start a meetup. You want to go – you want to become a speaker, start a meetup and start training people on speaking. You know, and then in that group of people, some of them will give you testimonials and then boom, you start offering your service. But yeah, I, I always believe if you wanted, especially if you wanted to go in any type of industry you're you're really passionate about, you know, start working for free, even like someone, you know, in admin or something, then try to learn something from that office and try to implement it once you go out in a year or even two years as well. Uh, I think that last thing I mentioned, the meetup thing, do they have meetups in Dubai? Yeah. They have, they have different software where you can set up a meetup. Uh, you have to find somebody that'll host the room for free, which, you know, and then you simply say, we're going to be talking about learning how to do this SEO. Is like a webinar or something like that? Or how to do webinars, how to get on podcasts, whatever it is you want to teach people how to do or mm-hmm. start doing. And you people come and you, you say, we're going to learn together, but you're the leader of the group, right? And you lead the group and you all you all journey there to learn it. And then you're teaching them while you learn it. And then all those people, I got this from Ted McGrath. He talked about that. And that's the way you break into something because you have, and you use that group to leverage things. Like he said, the, you want to get on a stage. He leveraged his people in his group to all buy tickets to a, to a, a speaking Maybe event. Maybe like a paid program or something. Well, then he called the thing and he said, how many, how many people, how many tickets would I have to sell for you to give me a spot? And all of his people in his group that he had started all bought tickets. <laughs> and then that gave him the, the gravitas to break, break in and get his first speaking spot on the big stage. Understood. Well, I, I actually maybe seen his ad once or twice. I actually have a couple of speakers who are um, similar to what he does, especially here in, in the UK as well. Um, it's quite an interesting business model. Um, as we're reaching towards uh, the end of this podcast, Uh, I just wanted to know where can people find you, David, and you know what's the name of your book? Yeah, you mentioned that the name of the book is The Million Dollar Rebuttal. And of course, right this little moniker right on the top says cold calling is not a numbers game. Something that we just talked about today. Yeah. But you can you can get my book. I'm on LinkedIn and I'm most active on that. I'll be I'll be on YouTube soon. 
because that's so powerful, but I'm, I'm waiting. I've got a whole strategy, but uh, LinkedIn is the number one. I mentioned that 30 day cold calling challenge I'm doing. It'll probably be gone by the time this podcast you're seeing this, but I'll probably have another one. I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be doing multiple ones. I'll probably start having some that are paid, right? A paid cold calling challenge, but I'm using that to write my next book, which is the 30 day cold calling challenge book. That's one of the reasons I'm doing it. I'm putting the content out there and then it'll be a book that people have. But the last thing is you get my book free, mm-hmm. plainbookoffer.com. You can get a free copy of my book. And then what I do is I actually have uh, a bunch of free videos. Uh, I did a master class with Jeremy McGillery. You get that. You get my ebook. Uh, you get videos training on how to get past gatekeepers. Mm-hmm. That's one of the things you get for free. And you just pay shipping when you go to there. But it's, it's plainbookoffer.com. All right, honestly. So you hear you heard it from David, guys. <laughs> Claimbookoffer.com and a million dollar rebuttal book. So David, my my last before my last and final question, I just wanted to acknowledge you for sharing your wisdom with us. I'm sure, especially the ones who are just starting out in business, will probably get the most value out of this conversation. Those who have don't have any experience from cold calling or even running a proper business. But for someone like you who probably you know, experienced bankruptcy personally from your dad and from your business as well, um, I just wanted to ask you my last and final question. If everything is a strip away from you, like you know, maybe three or five years from now, you, know, you scale your business, you have, I don't know how many employees and, and number X of revenue, and you got to start all over again. Because most people right now lost their businesses, lost their jobs, you know, trying to redefine themselves. For you, David, if everything is stripped away um, from you, what would be your main drive to succeed? My main drive to succeed? Your main drive to succeed. That's a subjective question. Well, my main drive, it's always, it's not about the money, right? When you focus on the money, you, you perform poorly. Your focus has to be, can I help people? The more you focus on actually helping people, uh, get the results they want. You know, the old the old adage is help enough other people get what they want and then you'll get what you want. Yes. Uh, that has to be part of your motive. But then, of course, obviously you want, you don't want to be a bum on the street, right? I mean, you need to make money, unfortunately, in this world to have any kind of subsidies and clothing and housing and all that. If everything's stripped away, like you said, then that's your your motivation is to have the basic things in life again. Right. But the way to get that is to focus on finding something that can help people. In fact, I'm trying to think there's a story of a guy who hair care products. Jan Paul DeJory or something? Yes. JP DeJory. Well, he was a bum in Hawaii and he found something in a trash can and he came up with a new way to help people make, I guess, style their hair. I don't have that problem. <laughs> style their hair. Right. And so it started with he didn't sit around and say, how can I make money? He actually found that he found a way to help people. And then it, it was both. They were tied up together, right? Because he was able to make money and and find a way to really help people style their hair better. You know, I, there's no better place to be a bum than Hawaii, though, right? <laughs> In the beaches. <laughs> and the, <laughs> <laughs> more tropical and all that. But anyway, David, uh, thank you so much for, for sharing your journey and wisdom with us. Thank you, David, for inviting me and uh, booking me on this podcast. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just keep us updated when the next book is out. And I'll definitely let our audience as well go to your website and claim that book because I'm sure you're going to have a tons of value as well. And any last words um, before we end this podcast? No, I mean, I think we covered a lot of great. I had a lot of good questions. Penit, you really got me. You said, how have you innovated? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Of course, I have innovated. You know, I have a new way. There is always a better way. And really cold calling is the last thing I would say is don't be afraid of it. It's not dead. It could be your best friend because that's what I was going to say is how I would build my business back would be making a few calls to people. Uh, Probably would try to get a job first, you know, to get something going quick and then try to work on my side hustle, right? Your side hustle while you got a job. That's how I do it. But pick up the phone and call and it's just have fun with it. Have fun when you're calling and it's not going to be painful. <laughs> yeah, I, I always, when I was starting out, I always believed that if you think about a person on the other end of, on the phone, that it's always different. 
you're going to have fun with it. You're going to rock it because, you know, you don't bring the, the past failure during the first call onto the second call. Right. So that's brilliant. Yeah. Cause that's, I, I write about that in my book is that the only thing that connects that last call to this call is you don't make that connection. It's a new company. It's new people, each call. And you have to kind of like refresh yourself. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Ready for the new call. And then they hang up on you. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, David, for your time. And until next time, God bless. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Also, we're now booking new guests for our show. So if it's your first time here or you are a returning subscriber, the Drive to Succeed podcast focuses on value-based conversations, stories that inspires and impact business growth and human potential. So if you know someone in your network or within your circle of influence that might fit the description, please go to the website at thedrivetosucceed.com forward slash guest. Again, the website is thedrivetosucceed.com forward slash guest. We are also running an online newsletter. So if you wanted to know more about the cool stuff we do, you can also check out the website at thedrivetosucceed.com forward slash newsletter. Once again, thank you for listening. Bye for now. <music>